Welcome to the London Open 2010. Top British players and international backgammon superstars met in London to play for tens of thousands of pounds. <music> 2010 has been a great year for backgammon. It's the first year of the World Backgammon Tour on which London is the fourth stop. The winners will play a 32,000 euro final in Paris, having taken in Denmark, Sweden, San Francisco, London and Tokyo. <music> 2010 also saw the creation of the US Backgammon Federation, which will hopefully come to rival the well-respected Danish Backgammon Federation. With founding membership costing up to $16,000, it's truly a chance for the Backgammon Glitterati to step up and show their support. There's no UK Federation yet, but the London Open is still going strong. We're going to look at the top five moments of the Backgammon in London Open 2010. We'll see the thrills, the spills and the dice rolls that really made this year's tournament. Before the tournament started, I called up with Philip Vishega to find out what he thought of the London Open. This is Philip Vishega. He's the 54th backgammon giant in the world. He's also from Holland. Philip, are you the only Dutch giant? Yes. Uh, as we have a very good players in the Netherlands, so I think in, we could have two or three giants. Yeah. But because they never play in international tournaments, uh, we have only one giant. Okay, so you're a bit of an exception then, because you go to quite a lot of international tournaments. Don't yes, you? I play. I, I used to play uh, one tournament in a month. Okay. Now it's a little bit less this year, yeah. so now maybe I play eight, eight tournaments, but still I enjoy it. <laughs> and so what are your favourite places to go and play? Uh, the favourite places are the cities like London, yeah. Paris, Venice, uh, that kind of cities which I like. And so a lot of the international players here, I think they're all quite well known on the kind of international circuit. Who do you think are the strongest players here? Uh, at this tournament? Yeah. Uh, I like from England, I do like very much uh, Federley. Yeah. I like him very much. I think he's the, one of the best. I like very much, he's uh, a very good player, uh, uh, Ray. Uh, oh, Raj. 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 Yes. Yeah. Zantani. Yes. One strong American, I think. Uh, okay. Paul Weaver. I yeah. Think, yeah. Player. Yeah. Good. I enjoy the match play. Yeah. And these uh, short matches, yes. like five or seven points, is, I think is very good for our backhand. Yeah. It's, okay. it's going much faster. Yes. You don't get very long games, matches. Yeah. And what you see normally when we play 13 or 15 points matches, yeah. finally it comes up to. 11 11 or 12 and 11 yeah so it, it seven points perfect yeah so it's just the same anyway if perfect. You play yeah. so philip who do you think are the biggest backgammon characters internationally uh, uh, special people like uh washi yes falafel yeah some guy yeah. funny yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and Carter, yes, okay. very nice. Yeah. I like him very much. Why? He has uh, a lot of humor, yes. which we need in, in the game. So you're having a good time? I have a very good time, and uh, with a city like this, you can only enjoy. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Philip. Nice. All right. Here in the studio with me is Chris Bray, the well-known columnist from the Independent newspaper, who's also written lots of books on backgammon, including. Backgammon to win. Next to him is Paul Weaver. Paul is the number 25 world backgammon giant and he co-authored the very influential book Backgammon Openings. So Chris, can you tell me a bit about yourself? I've played mind games all my life and I started with bridge and chess and I played those reasonably successfully when I was quite young. And about 30 years ago my then girlfriend, now wife Jill, taught me how to play backgammon. And I sort of ignored that for the first six months to a year. 
and then late one night system testing in my job as a computer programmer, um, I was challenged to a game backgammon by a guy who I lost £10 to, which was quite a lot of money back in those days. And I thought, I'm not having this. Uh, I'm going to go out and study the game. And that was always my way to find something to study if I wanted to improve. So I bought Jacoby and Crawford's uh, backgammon book, and I bought Dweck's uh, backgammon for profit, read those. A month later, I got my money back, got a bit more money, thought, this is good. And fundamentally, for the last 30 years, I've been hooked on playing the game. And I play every day, either uh, online or, or live. From a writing perspective, about 16 years ago, I always wrote sort of short articles for the guys at the club on positions that had arisen the previous week. And for a bit of fun, I sent them to the broadsheet newspapers in the UK. Got no response whatsoever. Thought, I'll just go back and write some more articles for the guys. Um, and then someone from The Independent rang me up out of the blue, said, I've just found this. It's, it's really quite interesting. Well, we're going to publish it. I thought, that's really nice. And they paid me, which is even nicer. Uh, and then he said, well, we haven't got much in the newspaper about games. Why don't you write a few more? And the first year, we published six articles, I think. Uh, and that was good, and it was good fun. And then a friend of mine, chess uh, grandmaster Bill Hartston, took over uh, the games page as it then became at The Independent and said, it'd be really nice, I think, if we had an article every week. And I thought, that's a really good idea. So for the last 16 years, I've written an article every week. Uh, some of those have been turned into books. Um, some of them are just articles. And so here we are, six books later. Um, Paul, your background book, I think, can be described as seminal. I think it's really been influential in developing the game. Can you tell me a bit about uh, how you wrote it? Um, I was very fortunate to uh, get acquainted with uh, Nack Ballard, and he and I started working together in 2002. And at the time, Nack was the uh, number one rated backgammon player uh, in the world. And uh, he's a very brilliant guy. His IQ is like several dozen points higher than mine. And I just totally enjoy uh, working with, uh, with Nack. And basically, uh, the way we wrote the book together is, is Nack produced the concepts and, uh, and I did the writing. I hope that uh, within a few years we can uh, produce a few more volumes in the series. Um, you've also been working with Moshi from Japan on his Backgammon.tv project. Can you tell me a bit about that? Mochi won the World Championship in Monte Carlo last year in 2009, and then this year he received the number one rating uh, on the Giant 32 list, and everybody uh, believes that Mochi uh, definitely deserves it. And he has started an ambitious project. He is trying to put together 100 different videos, each one of which is supposed to be about 15 minutes long. And Mochi asked me to, uh, to make some uh, videos for him, and so I was very happy to do it. Fantastic. Um, both of you guys were playing in the London Open. Can you uh, tell me who you think the, the top players there were? Well, uh, that's a really dangerous and loaded question uh, for two reasons. Number one, I don't really live in England and Europe, and so I don't really know for sure. And also, uh, anytime I start naming people, I'm, I am inevitably going to leave out somebody. <laughs> but uh, Julian Federline is generally considered to be the strongest player in Britain, and from what I've seen, he lives up to the billing. But there are several other very good players as well, including Chris Bray and Raj and, uh, and Peter Bennett. Anyone else to add to that list, Chris? Okay, so from my perspective, um, certainly Paul's mentioned the UK players, and my view has always been that there are seven to eight UK players who are very similar in strength, and if we were to field a team, uh, in a world championship, for example, I know who my top 10 UK players would be, and most of them were in that tournament at the weekend. Uh, we should not ignore the Americans. Uh, Carter Matig is probably the most travelled uh, American and uh, most often here at the moment, and uh, you know, I think he does a great job in uh, doing that and, and getting to tournaments all over Europe. Uh, Paul himself, uh, obviously a backgammon giant and a very strong player. We had the pleasure of playing each other in the last chance, which went to double match point, as nearly all matches do in backgammon. Uh, and Paul came out on top, that was great. Um, the Scandinavians were definitely very strong. Um, and the Danes are, because of the way that their infrastructure has been built up, have a much more powerful organisation than certainly we do in the UK. And from what I watched of the guys who are in the semi-final, um, they were definitely the people who deserved to be there. Great. So do you have a man of the match, someone who maybe was punching above their weight at the weekend or performed better than you would expect? Um, 
I think that's very difficult. I think backgammon is a game that requires phenomenal concentration plus the application of skill and, and to go through an entire weekend with a low error rate as the bots would have it um, is something that is so, so difficult. I watched the semi-final between Frederick and Ariel and from my perspective, Frederick made hardly any errors. Okay, Now, you're relying on my judgment as a backgammon player, but certainly for me, he was the strongest player I watched over the weekend, and he was very unlucky to lose, as we will see a little bit later on. Uh, and do you, Paul? Well, Julian Federline from England gets, uh, gets my billing because he really has a consistent uh, track record in performing very well in tournaments, and he has a very good concentration. He's a serious student of the game and he uh, performs well in tournament after tournament. Thanks very much. Let's look at the top five moments of the London Open.